welcome to your virtual field trip day. Mr. Wall and I are out here, here at Cherry Creek because today is the day where we're gonna be out discovering all that we would have learned had we had an opportunity to come out here together. Today we're going to be getting into the creek. We're going to be looking for different macro invertebrates. Remember those are the bugs that we can see with our eyes that don't have a backbone. But we're going to be looking for those in the creek as well as we're going to show you a little bit about how clear this water is using a tool called a turbidity tube. And then lastly we'll be showing you a little bit more about how to evaluate and determine whether or not a creek is healthy as we get a chance to look around to kind of map out what we see as well as then having you have a chance to do that at home. So here we go, let's get started. Hey boys and girls, so we're out here at Cherry Creek and we're studying water quality and we're looking at for all these different macro invertebrates. And it makes me think about, you know, the reason why we do this, why we study, study water quality and why it's so important to understand this. And I want to share with you a quick story, uh, a personal experience from about three years ago. While I was spending some time in East Africa, I came across a boy named Salim. And this young boy was about eight or nine years old. And every day coming back from missions, we would run across this young boy and he was making his journey from the Nile River up to his home. And he would always carry this bucket of water with him. And one day I stopped and talked to the young boy because his primary language was English. And he told me the story about how every day, every morning he has to get up, go three miles down to the Nile River, to the source and pick up water and bring it back to his family. The water source in his village was completely contaminated, okay? So they didn't have fresh water. And I think about all the water we have around us and how fortunate we are. And I think about Salim's story and just how, you know, there's just so many places in the world that don't have that, but it's also a cautionary tale. We must protect our own fresh water so we have fresh water to bathe with and fresh water to drink and clean. So part of this study, part of what we do when we go in here and we look for these creatures is to tell us, how is our water doing? And I caught a catfish, boys and girls. You'll definitely want to see this guy. You know, he's not a macroinvertebrate, but that's a pretty interesting find. I think you will agree. Definitely not what I came here to look for, but that's a pretty good find. That's pretty cool. Yeah. We're not expecting that. All right, so boys and girls, as we look for different macroinvertebrates, Again, back to what Mr. Wall was saying as to why we do this, as we are looking to see how clean or how healthy the water is. When we're looking for these different macroinvertebrates, what we notice about them is that different macros are found in different types of water. And that is because the water has different levels of cleanliness. When you think about the water when you get into a bath and it's really clean and then afterwards, after you get all that soot and dirt off, then it becomes really mucky and really dirty and it looks a lot different. Well, macroinvertebrates like different types of water. So when we look at some that we have here in our, in our tray, we see different guys that indicate how clean this water is. And even though this water is outside and it's got debris in it, this actually a really healthy, really clean water. We can see that we have macroinvertebrates like these uh, damsel flies that Mr. Wall was talking about earlier. But you can even see right near my finger, we have a, uh, oh, we, a blood midge is its name. And it's really, really small. You could barely tell, but he's red and he'll wiggle like a little worm. But this blood midge is a different macroinvertebrate that would be in a different level of cleanliness of water. So when we think about, well, if we find different macroinvertebrates and different levels of cleanliness of water, how clean is the water? And what we do as scientists is we always identify it based on the best level macroinvertebrates that we find. So if we find level one that are very intolerant of pollutants, it means they don't like polluted water. All they like is like your clean water. Then that means that the water has got to be clean. And if we find only up to level two, then that tells us that we have a level two type of water. The problem is if we only find level four, those that are very tolerant of pollutants, or then what that tells us is that the water is not very clean at all. But if we find level fours with level ones, then again, we go up to the level one because that tells us that this water, if it can support life for level one macroinvertebrates, 
then that means that this is really clean water. And the fact that we found some damselflies and even this mayfly that crawls around like a crab, those are really good finds. So this water is pretty healthy. All right, so ladies and gents, this is one of my all time favorite types of finds that we find in the creek. This is the shell of a caddis fly. Now, or a fly. These caddis flies, what they do is they make homes a lot like a turtle to where when you think about a turtle, a turtle has a really soft body, so it needs a shell to help keep it protected. So when we look at this type of shell, this is what they would make their home in. They would use sticks or debris in the stream to be able to wrap itself around so that it can be able to hide from predators and be able to stay safe. So unfortunately, it looks like the shell is empty. However, the shell is great evidence that there used to be a, uh, a caddis fly that w used to live here in the stream. And this is, again, one of my all time favorite finds whenever we find something like this. So, hey, boys and girls, you know, as I'm looking through this stuff, it's just chock full of macroinvertebrates. You know, sometimes they blend in really well because of their the coloration. And that's intentional, you know. Macroinvertebrates have definitely evolved to have camouflage patterns that are well suited for their environment. As he goes into the water, you're gonna notice that his rear kind of tilts up in the water and that's just one more defense mechanism and that's also how he breathes through his gills back there. Very different than this fish right here who breathes through gills on the side of his face. So just a lot of difference between these macro invertebrates and other things, but see, we've got another macro right here, another damselfly. So as we're looking through this, we just look for any movement um, and just a great opportunity to just find some more of these damselflies, some more mayflies. We just carefully pick through these things. I gotta tell you, boys and girls, I'm getting better at this. Mr. Burden is a master. He's really taught me well. I The day one, I gotta tell you, I didn't find like hardly a single thing. Now look at me. I found like five damselflies. Mr. Burden is the very best there is, that's all. All right, so while we're out here at the creek, another thing that scientists do is we're testing to see if the water's clean or not. Beyond simply what we find in the creek with the insects or those macroinvertebrates that we find, is we also look at and we evaluate how clear the water is. And that clarity of the water, we measure in this term called turbidity. So I have a tool that's called a turbidity tube, and this allows me to be able to measure how clear water is when it's flowing. There's a different type of tool that we would use in the middle of the lake, like if we were on a pontoon, we would use something called a secchi disc. But it works a lot the same. Right down the middle of this tube, at the very bottom, there's a black and white. And I'll bring it up so that you can see this black and white separation. This is how I'm able to look down to see if the water, how clear the water is. So what I do with this tube is I dip it down into the stream. I fill it all the way up, and then as I fill it up, raise it up and what I'm going to do now is I'm looking down to see if I can differentiate and I can tell the difference between black and white at the very bottom and as I look down if I can see the difference then that tells me based on my measurement here on the side as to how clear the water is and the more that water that's in here that I can see through the clearer the water is so the fact that we can see all the way down at the bottom almost all the way filled to the top with the turbidity tube tells us that this water is pretty clean. This water is very, very clean. I would actually probably need an even larger tur turbidity tube to measure it. But if I couldn't see all the way down, what we do then is we let this pinch at the end, we let the water out slowly. And what that allows me to do is to continue to look down at the bottom until I can see that difference between black and white. And when I can, I pinch that off, so then I'm able to look back and I can measure out the sea. Okay, that's going to be approximately 50, uh, 53 centimeters that I'm able to see when we look down to the base as to how clear this water is. And again, how clear the water is is really important because it measures for us, like we were saying, how healthy. Uh, but when we think about clarity of water, it's, it's, like, a, it's like dominoes. Have you ever set up dominoes before and as you set them up, when you push one down, it pushes the others and it has kind of a cause and effect. Well, the clarity of the water is a lot like that because when water is really clear, it will stay cool. And when water is cool, the temperature 
will be a lot lower, which means that it can hold more oxygen in the water. Because when water is colder, it's going to be able to hold more oxygen, more dissolved oxygen for the, in, for the macroinvertebrates and for the fish in the water. When the water is really, really cloudy, it heats up a lot faster. It's kind of like when you wear a black shirt during the summertime and you heat up really fast because it's really dark. That's what happens in the water when it's really cloudy. It gets really warm, and when it gets really warm, it can't hold as much oxygen. And when it can't hold as much oxygen, that's bad for all the things that call this place home and live here. So when we measure how clear the water is, when we talk about turbidity, it's because it impacts the temperature, which impacts the oxygen in the water, which is important for all the things that call this place home. So that's why we test the turbidity of the water. All right, boys and girls, I'm going to talk about two physical properties of the creek. The first one requires a simple tool called a thermometer. The thermometer is going to be able to be able to measure the temperature of the stream. Now, there's a couple of important things to note here. First of all, this thermometer measures in Celsius rather than Fahrenheit. So scientists oftentimes use Celsius to measure temperature when they're talking about different things. The second thing to understand is that when you're measuring the temperature of water, you want to go with, uh, you don't want to just get the surface temperature because that can kind of throw it off. The sun heats up the surface a lot warmer than down lower. So when you take this thermometer, you want to go ahead and put it down, you know, a little deeper and closer to the bottom, not on the bottom, but near the bottom. And you're gonna, you're gonna wait like 10, 20 seconds or so, maybe even 30 seconds, and I'll let that mercury settle down and to find out an accurate reading. Now I've been out here before and I know the temperature of the creek is running about 12 degrees Celsius. I would challenge you to think about what is 12 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? How could you figure that out? How could you make that conversion in a way with a, with a degree that you're a little more familiar with? So today it's running about 15. So it's actually up three degrees today from yesterday. Well, boys and girls, that's really interesting because from day to day, we can actually take temperature readings and you know, even better from year to year. This has power you know, from year to year to year. So we really wanna to try to get as much data as possible. Hey, boys and girls, it's time for physical property number two, which is measuring the flow rate of the stream. So today I'm using a simple tennis ball to help visualize how quickly this water is moving. If we look at the water, we can't really tell just exactly how fast it's moving. We need a reference point. So what I've done is I've picked out two trees, one tree right there and one tree right here. And those trees are about 10 meters apart. You wanna to try to get about 10 meters when you're doing this. You're gonna drop it at the start point and pick it up at the finish point and time the amount of time it takes from that tennis ball to get from point A to point B. To figure out the flow rate of the stream, it's simply distance divided by time. So 10 meters divided by however many seconds it takes, boys and girls, and that will give us an accurate picture of how quickly the stream is moving. Streams are constantly changing. Just last week, we had some thunderstorms and things like that, a lot of rain. This, street, this creek is much higher than it was before, and it's moving a lot more rapidly than a few weeks ago when we were out here. That changes everything. Changes the macros we can find. Changes the type of fish that might live in the area. Changes where things are living. So the habitat really changes with this. All right, boys and girls, let's try it out. Again, as scientists, we're investigating it by getting into the water and looking for those macroinvertebrates. We also, as scientists, will use uh, 
tools in chemistry to be able to help better understand what's happening that we can't see in the water. But then we also look at the physical parts of the stream, which is what we were doing when we used the turbidity tube and when we used the, the thermometer to be able to measure the temperature and we used the tennis ball to be able to measure the flow rate. All those things help us better understand what we visually see in the creek. But then we also, not only when we're in the creek, but we also look around, we look at how the stream moves, how it bends, we look at what environments around it, if there's uh, things that are natural or if there's a lot of man-made things around it. So what we would normally do as scientists is we would draw a site map that helps us better understand from every time we come out if there's any physical changes to the stream. So what we want you to do to practice this is to draw out a site map of your yard. If you have a front yard or a backyard, or even if you live in, in an apartment area, you can look at maybe a, a yard around the apartment complex. But I want you to draw out then kind of a map of the area where you live and see and identify the parts in your map that are natural, those that are there because they've been there for a long time. They weren't put there by man. And then other things that are man-made, things that we put there over time and that we've impacted. And understanding that everywhere around you there are natural and there are things that are man-made that helps you better understand your environment and the place where you do your testing. Kind of like what we do here at Cherry Creek.